Well, good morning, church. It's good morning. Beautiful day. I notice a lot of family in visiting family, and we have church family out visiting family, other places. We're glad you're here, wherever you're from. Hope you have a good weekend and good visit with your loved ones. Be careful tomorrow. The 4th of July is not a day you want to be in the emergency room. I know from experience. It's one day to avoid that place. Uh, tomorrow, our nation celebrates its 246th birthday. I have a sister here who celebrates her birthday tomorrow. They're in town visiting. If I told you that number, I'd be in trouble. Rest assured, it's less than 246. <laughs> but her and her family, her husband Jim, her son Noah, are, are here uh, visiting us. And by the way, I'll mention that uh, Noah, my nephew, uh, was baptized this week at church camp. So he... <laughs> We're very proud of him. But, uh, you know, another... Another July 4th comes around, another Independence Day, and as it always has, our nation has problems that we're thinking about. Every generation of Americans probably thought at one time or another that the problems that they faced were greater than at any other time. And I'm sure as we consider what's going on, we feel the same. There are a lot of cures that are bandied about, a lot of debates about what should be done, a lot of programs and, and personalities offered as solutions to our ills. People, you know, they feel if, if a certain policy was enacted or, or a proposal followed or if this or that party or ideology prevailed, then we could really turn things around. We have great economic challenges at this time. But who would say that those are worse than our moral challenges? There are military and, and national security concerns as well. We're, we're, we're roiled as a people about education and immigration and inflation, and we could just go on and on, couldn't we, about the things that might concern us. But at the root of it all, are these things really our problem? I love the old quote. We don't really know who said it, although you'll hear it attributed to this or that person, but. It's an old quote, and it goes something like this. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. We think that was first spoken over two centuries ago. And whoever said it, it's true, and it remains true. It, in fact, has always been true of any nation, indeed, it's true of more than just nations. It's true of people. It's true of churches. It is true of organizations, whatever it might be. Our greatness is related directly to our goodness. And of course, our goodness is related directly to our God. How is America doing with her God? How am I doing with my God? How is this church doing with its God? Those are key questions. Perhaps our greatest prayer for our nation today would be that it would experience a revival, a spiritual revival of its relationship with its God. 
Now, the Bible, of course, has quite a bit to say about the subject of revival. It talks about revival in very bleak times. We might look at our nation and say, it's crazy to think there could be a spiritual revival in this place. But rest assured, if you study the scripture closely, you will see revival in times worse than what we are in. So let's think about this today a little. There was a woman who uh, called her daughter one time. She's very concerned, very excited, concerned. She asked her daughter, Dear, have you spoken to your grandmother recently? I've tried to call her every evening this week and there's been no answer. She really should be at home. I'm beginning to worry. Well, the daughter thought about it for a moment and she said, Oh, I know what it is. They're having a revival at the retirement village this week. I'll bet that's where grandmom has been when you've called. And the woman exclaimed, she said, revival? What on earth do they need with a revival? What kind of sins could they possibly have at a retirement village for crying out loud? And the daughter wisely answered, old ones, mother. <laughs> old ones. When you think about it, there's really not any other kind of sins than old ones. There are no new sins. I know we like to think we've invented new ones in our culture, but really it's just the same old ones being rehashed and, and reinvented all the time. And all of them lead us away from a holy God. You know, many people don't like the idea of revival because of all it implies. Because it implies things like the need to confess sin and, and to repent of sin and to recommit to something, to recommit to faith. But the scripture constantly calls people and nations to do those very things. It encourages revival. And maybe the greatest book in the Bible on revival is in the Old Testament, the book of Second Chronicles. In that book, we find both a prescription for revival as well as a common pattern that revivals follow. Let's think first of all this morning about the prescription for revival. I want us to look at what is probably the most often quoted verse from this book. Um, I realize Second Chronicles is a bit of an obscure book, but there is at least one famous verse in it. It's in chapter 7 and verse 14 of Second Chronicles. I memorized this verse when for years we participated in life chains in West Virginia. Life chains, if you don't know what they are, there were peaceful, silent demonstrations against abortion. And we would hold a sign with a message on it, a pro-life message. And, and we would stand along what was the busiest road in the state of West Virginia and hold that on a Sunday afternoon for an hour. And printed on the back of that sign would be various scriptures and things to consider and, and prayers and so forth. And, and there was one main verse that was totally printed out and sort of boxed in and emphasized on the back of that sign. It was 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, the context of that important verse is as follows. King Solomon has just completed the building of the great temple of the Lord. 
and that worship center is being dedicated. God has approved of the work. He's shown his approval by moving his divine presence into the temple in an amazing manifestation of his power that all could see. And then he appears to Solomon in a vision that night and has sort of a strange message for the king. He says, uh, in, in, in summary, he says, Solomon, these people, this nation, they're going to sin. And as a result, I'm going to punish them. It might involve my withholding rain from their lands. Or it might be that I'll send a locust plague and consume their fields. When that happens, the Lord says to Solomon, here is how they can turn things around and avoid total disaster. And then we get the verse that we just read, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In that verse, there are three things that the people need to do to bring about spiritual revival. And then there are three things that God will do in response. The three things the people must do are these. Number one, humble themselves. Number two, pray. And number three, turn from their sin. If they do this, then God promises to, number one, hear their prayers. Number two, forgive their sins. And number three, heal their land. Well, it's pretty simple one, two, three, isn't it? For revival. It's not complicated. Uh, it may be hard to apply, may be difficult to do, because it involves getting rid of pride. And it involves turning back to God, admitting we've turned away from him. But how it's done, the prescription for revival is not hard to follow. Humble self, pray, Turn from sin, and then God will hear and forgive and heal. Now, if you read the rest of the book of 2 Chronicles, and it's a long book, 36 chapters, but if you read through it, you will see all these examples of how this happened in the nation of Israel. How this very thing we just went through worked out several times among God's people at the time. How they would sin and God would remove his blessing and punish them in some way and then how they would respond in prayer and repentance and a renewed seeking after God. And then in turn God would hear them and forgive them and Restore them. It happens over and over. I want us just to think for a moment about one example of this this morning that occurred during the reign of King Josiah. It's described over in chapter 34 of Second Chronicles. Josiah's father and grandfather were among the absolute worst kings in the history of God's people. His dad was so bad that his own servants rose up and murdered him, assassinated him. And, and that's why Josiah comes to the throne at such a young age. He's just eight years old in, uh, in the time he becomes king. That's told in chapter 34, verse 1. Imagine an eight-year-old king. But there was something different about Josiah 
Immediately, it seemed, this was obvious. Uh, he had a different heart. He had a, a heart that truly sought God. By the time he was a teenager, he's 16 years old. He's been king for eight years. He begins to not only seek God, but also to turn the nation toward God and, and, and turn it from its terrible sin. He leads them in massive reforms that influence every area of life in Israel. He goes throughout the land pulling down idols that had been stood up and, and that the people were worshiping and, and getting rid of all these religious leaders who had led the people into this terrible mess. He cleanses the land as a teenager. Here's a truth that we need to, to ponder. Revival often comes at just the right time. When things are at their bleakest. And, and, and they're often begun in the heart of one or just a few righteous individuals who are willing to take a stand and confront their culture. They can even be started by a teenager like Josiah. Revivals often also include the tearing down of idols. Uh, for Josiah and Israel, idols were these monuments or statues that people bowed down to in the place of the Lord God and devoted themselves to. For us today, it may be just about anything that we place before our Creator. Anything that gets priority in our lives before the God of the universe is an idol to us. So think of all the things our country has placed before its God in the last 246 years. Think of the things churches can put before God. And think of the things you and I place before God. Revival means those things are taken down. And, and we strive to seek God fully once more. That's the essence of revival. And then in, in Josiah's revival, a very interesting thing happens. Um, this, this part of the story is related in verses 8 through 13 of chapter 34. Just amazing to me what, what takes place. The land, again, has been cleansed of idols and, and people are thinking about the true God once again, devoting themselves to him and their loyalties are no more divided among so many other things. And an interesting thing happens to the treasury of the land. It begins to increase and multiply and overflow. People are giving to God's work once more. The coffers begin to fill up in Israel. And, and so Josiah wisely takes that increased money and puts it to good work. He, he sets those who, whose responsibility was to take care of the temple. He sets them to repairing it. It apparently had been neglected. To cleaning it out and refurbishing it. The priorities have changed in Israel. And it's very obvious. The people are giving generously. The work of the Lord is beginning to be done once again. I just think it's so interesting. You know, in our nation, in our day, we're so concerned about economics and inflation. And how do we fix this? And, and how do we restore prosperity how do we get gas prices down? I have yet to hear anybody 
from any party with any influence suggests something like 2 Chronicles 7, 14 and the example of young King Josiah. When Josiah led the people back to their God, the economy of Israel flourished. You heard any better ideas from many of our brilliant politicians in Washington? Or anywhere? And then one more fascinating thing happens in Josiah's revival. Because the people, again, were giving so well, and Josiah is investing it in many things, including refurbishing the temple, work of the Lord's being renewed. They're fixing the temple up and so forth and cleaning it out. And guess what they found? The Bible. A copy of the law. It had been lost. We think, how is that possible? Well, again, just read about Josiah's father and grandfather. His grandfather, Manasseh, the absolute worst king ever, had been king for 50 years. For 50 years, he had hid the Bible, the word of God, and it, it had been lost to the people. More than a generation. A copy of the law is gathering cobwebs in some storeroom in the temple. But the workers find it. This is in verse 14 and following of that chapter. And, and they find this copy of the law. They bring it to the king and Josiah reads it. He reads the word of God and you know what he starts to do? He starts to obey it. And he starts to teach it to the people and to see that it's taught. And he insists that the nation Listen, sit up and pay attention and obey the word of God. And then if you just, from chapter 34, you read the next couple of chapters to the end of the book, you will see how they did just that. That they heard the word of God and they obeyed it and the nation of Israel was revived. Revival always includes a renewed emphasis upon and obedience to the word of God. How does, a, how does a nation, a church, an individual seek the face of God in the language of 2 Chronicles 7, 14? How do they do that? They do it through prayer. They do it through devotion to the words of God. So my prayer for my country on its birthday tomorrow is revival. That's also my prayer for the churches. Our churches need revival. And it's my prayer for you and for me. The prescription is not difficult. We've seen the prescription for revival. Verse 14 of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And then we've seen one major example of how it works. Chapter 34 and King Josiah. May wise people learn the lessons they need to learn from God's word. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for your love and grace and mercy. We need it so much. At all levels, nationally, locally, personally, we need you more than ever. We pray for revival. We pray for renewed devotion to you, to your word. 
and we pray you will bless us to those ends. Thank you for the greatest gift you ever gave us, your son, who offers us forgiveness of every sin. We've remembered him this morning in his supper. We pray we will go out and live that truth this week because that is true freedom. Father, this morning, if there be any here who need to have the courage to, to confess and repent, to obey the gospel, we, we pray they will, will do so while they have time. Thank you for your love and for hearing us always. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. Thank you this morning for being here and for listening. As we conclude, we sing again and offer you an opportunity if you need some help, prayers of the church, or need to come to the Lord, obey the Lord, and start your walk with him. You have time that you can do that. We could baptize you this morning, and we would rejoice to see that. Please let us know how we can minister to you while we stand and sing this song.